And now we're gonna set up transfer measurement. So what I'll do I'm going to zero. Uh, of course, we're a little bit too small. Ran out of travel. I'm going to set my indicator close to parallel. And zero. Okay, so I got zero, and now I'm gonna run my part. And relative to this 0.514 uh, stock I made, the part is eh, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit different. And you can see it, it depends on how I've, I've flipped this over and I get more error. And when I check it this way, I get less error. Oops. get about a, almost a half thousandth difference. So um, check out this video feed if it's hard to see on the, on the TV there. Um, what's nice about this setup is I can set up just one Joe Block stack, set my zero, and then if I have a bunch of these parts to check, I can just run it through, and run, up, run the next one through, run the next one through, run the next one through, you know, rotate it around, but it's a great way to check a lot of parts and it's a very accurate way to even check just one part because I'm now using all the accuracy is the difference between this indicator and the hat and the stack height. We're no longer involving the height gauge, which I told you is not as, as accurate as this, this, these two pieces. So we're getting rid of the, the least accurate part of the measurement, which might be zeroing on the bottom of the rock and working our way up and doing a direct measurement that way. So it's a, it's a nice way to reduce your potential for error. And I use it all the time. It's one of my uh, go-to methods for working with a height gauge. All right. So Next up, we're gonna start working with gauge pins again. And I've already told you how much I like gauge pins for measuring holes. And I like them for uh, measuring certain features with a surface plate. Which, so I don't know why I just did that. I'm gonna need this for the gauge pin check. Um, what I wanted to do was get rid of the stack. So, um, basically, gauge pins make a great fixture for either resting a part on for a runout check or for locating a hole and when you want to use a surface plate. Now, we've already talked about the basics of accuracy and applications and hole inspection, so I'm not going to do that again. We're just going to talk about how you can use them on a surface plate. And... One of these pins goes into the flange. It's this one. It's definitely this one. And I'll show you how we clamp it on. So I can clamp on this pin. The pin has that near perfect accuracy I always talk about. Um, and so does the V block. And so does the surface plate. So when you combine all three, you don't really introduce any new error into the equation. So now I've got a, a nice clamped V-block, just like in the picture here. And you can slide your part on and, and do your checks. And now you're registered on the ID, which can be useful for many checks. Um, it can make it more balanced. It could also be a datum, in which case now you've slid your, your datum onto a, onto a gauge pin which will help with your measurement. Um, 
So one key thing to remember, whether you're doing this in a milled part or on a turned part, you know, checking for run out, your gauge pin's always gonna have a little bit of a gap. And when you have that little of a gap, your part is gonna rock a tiny bit. So you try to find the largest pin that you have that will fit and minimize that error. A lot of holes are gonna be tapered like you see um, in this picture. So um, when they're tapered that way, one end is gonna be tight and one end might be loose, but realistically it should be within a thousandth or two. You know, you shouldn't have a lot of taper and precision holes. So um, again, this is another technique I use all the time and um, quite happy with it whenever I need to do run out checks or, or hole locations. So um, let's do a, a quick run out and circularity check on the surface plate. So as you can see, I've already got it clamped on and I can just slide my part on. And first of all, let's check how much wiggle there is. So I'm gonna sweep for center like I've always talked about. Oh wow, I'm getting, I'm getting really lucky with my pressure in this video series. All right, so I'm at zero. Let's see how much wiggle there is. There's not a lot of wiggle because I have, I, I was, I'll keep twisting it. Not a whole lot of wiggle. So I've got a very tight fit on my pin and then I can rotate it around and yeah, you see the pin falling in the hole, but other than that, um, took my eye off the, off the gauge, it fell off center. It's very, um, it's pretty consistent. And then I'll do a run out check, I'll flip it around, make it a little easier on me. And do a run out check. Now I'm checking the ID against these surfaces. So I'm doing run out on both surfaces. Indicator's barely moving, tiny bit. So um, part of that is me knocking the Joe block around, the gauge block, the V block. So pretty stable, um, pretty good condition part. And once I, like I said, both of these are a run out check because I'm registered on the ID and I've got my indicator on other surfaces. Um, Once again, feel free to involve the drop gauge. Um, I won't show it on the secondary camera to save a little time, but you know, feel free to drop this down, set up your you know, stroke on, on center, and then spin it around. Oh, well, of course it falls in the hole. Um, you will want to be careful that this, again, this adds quite a bit of weight. It might throw your part out of balance, but Otherwise, oops, fell off. Wasn't paying attention. Well, I was trying to pay attention to the monitor, so um, not getting any movement on the indicator from what I can see. And I wouldn't expect any. But yeah, feel free to involve your, your drop gauge. I do this all the time as well. I think uh, I, use, uh, I use these two gauges almost um, almost the equal amount and I actually prefer to use a drop gauge as much as I can uh, because of how easy they are to work with and, and drop up and down and this is a perfect way to use it but I probably would use a height gauge as my first choice if it got larger it's such a small part I, I would probably use the test gauge but as it got larger and larger I'd be more inclined to use a, a drop gauge um, Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, now to do a hole location, um, yeah, to do a hole location, um, we could not use the pin and we could try to get our indicator inside of a hole and sweep the bottom of the hole and find the bottom of the hole. 
use our height gauge travel just like we do with um, any time we use the height gauge. But um, I'm going to show you both ways. I'm going to show you with a pin and without a pin. So let me show you without a pin first. So I'm going to grab, I'm going to get zero off of the bottom. Once again, I need to adjust my indicator. So I'm going to set zero, my indicator, zero, and zero here. And I'm going to move up and go inside of this hole and then go down. And now what I need to do is I need to sweep the bottom. Okay. So my indicator is inside the hole. You can see that a little better. And now I'm going to sweep the bottom looking for that point where it turns around. Okay, it turns around right there. So I'm going to set it there. And now with my pressure, adjust to read zero. Take my reading. Uh, 0 0.309 is what it looks like. And well, how big's the hole, right? We were, we're interested in the center point. If you check out the print for PMO2, the angle block, uh, we should be about half an inch to the center point to the bottom of the hole. So how big's the hole? Let's use our gauge pin, figure out how big our hole is. So our the largest pin, I already, I already grabbed the largest pin from the set. The largest pin that would go in is a 0.3875. So let's do a little math together. So point three eight seven five divided by two what does that equal okay. man hold on a sec you know what I'm a little uh I'm a little cramped on space here so let me yeah. And I'm trying not to break anything. So 0.3875, divide that by 2, and you get, uh, let's see, 150, 190, uh, 193 and a half, let's call it 194, round up. So uh, I've rounded up to make the math a little bit easier. And uh, what did I get with my indicator measurement? I got uh, 0.309. So my center point will be 0.503. Uh, which is in spec and pretty much what I what I expected it to be. So that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way to do it would be to use that pin I, I used to figure out how big the hole is and put that into the part. And we can repeat our zero just to verify everything's still good. Okay, reading zero, and then I can come up and sweep the top. Adjust our pressure. And 
And what am I reading now? I am reading about 0.688. And what I can do is subtract. Let's see, I won't show you on the camera, but um, you can follow along with your calculator. So 0 0.688 minus 0 0.194 get 4, 9, 4.94. So both are in the ballpark. Uh, 0.494 is what I got uh, for the center point. And just because I got very different readings, I'm going to re-verify my zeros. Once again, I'm going through sanity check. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I'm going to flip it around and check the other side. So I'm sweeping for top. Yeah, 0.690. So what does that mean? With one method, I got 0.503. With another method, I got about 0.495. Uh, if I take a look at this hole, it's got a lot of chatter in it. And I'll bet if I use a caliper, point three ten, I'm verifying, sorry, off camera, point three ten. This is the one that I did uh, without the pin. I got 309. And with the pen, I'm, uh, with the caliper, I'm getting 310. But with the pen, I'm getting a much different reading. And that tells me even though this is the largest pin that goes in there, there's a little bit of play, which makes me think the hole is not round because of all the chatter I saw. So, so ah, you know what? Let's take a break uh, while I uh, reload the camera and um, give me a second.